I'm Jim Wells and I'm the Deputy Chair of the Health Committee. I'm afraid like all of these it'll be a, a fleeting visit because we've Justice Committee on this afternoon and I happen to have landed myself in the two busiest committees in this building. So I've obviously committed a very serious offence in a previous life. Um, this is a very important issue, public health, because it's very much been a Cinderella of health service provision in Northern Ireland. Indeed, it could be said what we have is a sickness service rather than a health service. And expenditure on public health in Northern Ireland is radically smaller than most other Western European nations. Uh, <clears throat> the definition of public health is defined as the science and art of promoting and protecting health and well-being, preventing ill health and prolonging life through the organised efforts of society. And there's this very famous picture on the Chief Medical Officer's report, which shows that if you take a bus from the markets area of South Belfast to the top of the Malone Road, your average life expectancy increases by nine years. And that's not the air. It's not even to some extent the housing. It's lifestyle choices. We had a fascinating seminar here yesterday morning from the South East Health Trust, which showed that every year the equivalent of four jumbo jets full of passengers die in Northern Ireland because of smoking. And that the poorest person in Northern Ireland who's a non-smoker on average will live longer than the richest person who is a smoker which I think is a very, very telling comment that smoking is one of the main issues we're facing in the public health agenda. The other quite shocking statistic that was revealed yesterday is that the average single parent on income support in Northern Ireland spends £200 a month on cigarettes. £200 a month, the average single parent on income support. Now, when you think about all of the health indicators for children in that situation, you realise that not only the fact that there's parents smoking in the house, but also the fact that clearly good nutrition will be sacrificed in order to achieve that, I think it's quite a serious issue. There's the other issues of obesity, um, overall, cons overall consumption of alcohol, particularly binge drinking, uh, the growth of drugs, the reduction in exercise. I think most people in Northern Ireland no longer want to drive to the shops, they want to drive into the shops. I watched a gentleman in Rafaelin the other day he got out of his car, he was rather a ton gentleman, he got out of his car, he went to the baker. He then drove the car about 20 yards down the street and went to the butcher and then drove the car across the street to the newsagent. The concept of actually getting out and walking to those various uh, shops was just totally, uh, just, he couldn't grasp it. So we do have a problem. Affluence brings problems, affluence brings severe health problems. And it's something that we as a society have to, to face, for, not only for the well-being of our community, but the reality is if we don't tackle some of these issues soon, they could completely swamp the national health service as we know it. Obesity is leading to a rapid rise in type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes can be incredibly difficult to, to treat and very expensive because it's a long-term condition. So it, the Simon Hamiltons of this world hope that we can tackle this issue not only the health ministers as well. We need to get a grip of our public health. Myself and the chair and the clerk of the committee went to Cuba in November 2012, and we saw the incredible emphasis on public health there. There you have a third world economy with a first world health service. A health service where every man, woman, and child is examined every year uh, for any condition including tested and equipment made by Randox and Crumlin, which I thought was quite interesting. They're tested, and if there's the slightest hint of a problem, they're then put into a system through clinics for that to be dealt with. And I asked the taxi drivers, well, what happens if nobody goes? And they looked at me. They didn't really comprehend what I was saying. What do you mean, nobody goes? We all go. We all have our check. And the Cuban system places far more emphasis on what we do as public health rather than, than the A&E type services. And I think we could learn a lot from that country, which spends an average of about $500 per person uh, on its health service. We spend £2,560 per person, and yet we don't live any longer. And there's a lot to be learned from that example. So the reality is that your health in Northern Ireland is often dictated not by what you do, but where you live. And in disadvantaged communities throughout the province, there's very clear examples of many who die prematurely, are living conditions that need not do so. And we, whilst we have to take a province-wide approach to health improvement, we must seek to reduce such inequalities. 
Now, in Northern Ireland, we have the Public Health uh, Agency, which, of course, is quite a recent development. We didn't even have a PHA five or six years ago, but it is seen now as one of the ch its work is seen as one of the chief uh, issues in the in the agenda of the chief medical officer. And that office, the PHA, takes the lead on health promotion, disease, disease prevention, emergency planning, health protection, and environmental health. The current public health framework for Northern Ireland was published in 2012, and of course everyone here would have a, an encyclopedic knowledge of it, uh, and it was, that was the Fit and Well Changing Lives Strategy. And that's a high-level document which seeks to drive action on current and future public health and well-being priorities. Some of this is our genetic makeup. Fortunately for me, the, the Wellses go on and on and on. My uh, grandfather, was, my uncle was 95 when they took the driving licence off him. The Wellses don't smoke, drink or chase after women, and that helps our genes. And therefore, three big killers we try to avoid. <laughs> the big killer, if you, my wife caught me with another woman, that would be a big killer. And uh, certainly, uh, for some of us, fortunately, it's genetic. But others, I met a man this morning, and he had a heart attack when he was 27. His father died of a heart attack at 45. So genetically, he's got problems, and lifestyle changes will help, but he has got a, a track record, which unfortunately is not good. So our speakers today are going to share their thoughts on research that have been working, they've been working on in relation to some of these factors, including sport, uh, physical recreation activity, and crash rates of young drivers. I have to say, I think some of our young people at the minute think that manual labour is a Spanish footballer. They just have no concept of anything that requires a sweat or, or getting any form of effort. So therefore, the work that we're going to hear this afternoon, I think, is going to be very useful. First of all, we have Mr. Dr. David Hassan uh, of the University of Ulster and Dr. Lynette Hughes from NIAMH. And they will examine the range of societal effects of the participation of sport, including improving mental health and seeking to engage with the marginalised youth through sport. Uh, secondly, we have Professor Lindsay Pryor of Queen's University. I hope, uh, which, which, which one's Lindsay? Good. Well, I, I'm glad Lindsay you're here. Not because, no, not for, yes, I was going to say, I was going, that's what I was checking because <laughs> I, I have been known to put Joe into the same room in a dormitory as David, only to find out that Joe's a female. So therefore, it's important to establish that Lindsay indeed is, is a gentleman. And he will be presenting the public health implications of crash rates among young drivers and interventions such as the graduate driver licensing that is shown to be effective in reducing these rates. And the final presentation will be delivered by Dr. Mark Tully and Dr. Ruth Hunter from Queen's University on the subject of the importance of regular physical health, of physical activity to health, society and the economy. And the research will highlight that over 60% of adults in Northern Ireland are not meeting current recommendations in this area. And you're looking at one, I tell you, you're looking at one. Uh, and we need a major rethink on this. And clearly the stats would show the, advan the advantages of half an hour's Brisk physical exercise per person per day would have enormous implications for health in Northern Ireland, but how many of us do it? Uh, and I live a very sedentary lifestyle, I can assure you, and at times I find it very difficult to devote any time to physical exercise. So, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, as I say, I have to dash into a, a, what's going to be a long and torrid uh, Justice Committee meeting, um, and I'll be lucky to get out here before seven. But could I wish you all the best, and I'm sure you'll enjoy the benefit of these top line speakers who are experts in their field. Thank you. This presentation will really take two parts. One will be the first uh, 10 minutes or so, which I will take covering the context in which sport uh, engages in society, the role that it plays in society, certainly around questions of vulnerability. And then the second half of it will be covered by my colleague, uh, Dr. Lynette Hughes from Northern Ireland Association for Mental Health, who speaks specifically about the issue of uh, sport and how it helps to address uh, issues that may arise in that area. So um, sport, as we probably already know, is an important part of the lives of many people who live here in Northern Ireland. According to DECAL Sport NI figures, the, uh, sport contributes about 2.3% of the gross domestic product of the region, which is approximately £650 million pounds per annum. Um, beyond the physical benefits, of course, of regular participation in sport and physical activity, uh, sport has also been used to complement broader, what we may term, social development initiatives, uh, particularly within Greater Belfast. Now, these include programmes, of course, that use sport to assist in addressing educational underachievement, deviance, isolation, unemployment and, of course, uh, mental health concerns, which we will focus on today. And uh, in a related development uh, to the role of sport in this regard, 
You'll be aware, of course, over the last 12 months of the work of the Belfast Strategic Partnership, um, which has made the promotion of so-called resilient communities here in Northern Ireland a core priority. And the main uh, sporting initiatives of the uh, type we are discussing here and are aimed at uh, young people who are considered vulnerable, either in regard to their current circumstances or displaying symptoms that may indicate uh, the possibility of, uh, let's say, future socially undesirable uh, behaviour. Theories of uh, social vulnerability broadly refer to distorted relationships that uh, such young people have with institutes, institutions of society, such as uh, family, school, the employment market, healthcare, and the youth justice uh, system. Fundamental to this process is the progressive accumulation of uh, negative experiences with such institutions, which eventually give rise to social dis disconnectedness and with this, an unfavorable uh, future personal prognosis. All of these issues will presumably be central to DECAL's determination to make health and well-being a core priority under its promoting equality, targeting social exclusion remit. So in the view of some, sports retain the potential to positively influence the culturally hard to measure factors that are often the root cause of young people's social vulnerabilities. These include how the enforcement of rules within a given sports setting influence processes of respect and conformity. Similarly, the manner in which questions of commitment and status on the part of vulnerable youth are mediated. Depending upon the nature of the sports activity on offer, the important role of the coach or the sports leader, in particular their own identity and their personal life story. And again, how this might influence affection and attachment outcomes. The impact of organisational context as a whole and its relationship with other key social institutions that exist. And finally, consideration of what might broadly be categorised as other background characteristics, for example, social class and levels of uh, disposable household income. Combined, seen together, all of these factors affect participants' response to any defined sports-led uh, intervention. So for many, sport is seen as a social glue which serves to cohere, build and strengthen communities. But this proposition, which underpins broader arguments about sport's impact, has often remained untested. There exists instead a general belief in sport's potential for good, but a range of commentators remain sceptical of the blind faith that policymakers often display in this regard, again referring to the lack of evidence that exists displaying the causal link between sports participation and a raft of societal benefits thought to be associated with it. Thus, evidence for sports role in facilitating the social outcomes of the types mentioned here is, for the most part, undermined by both conceptual and methodological weaknesses and little or no considerations of the conditions from which they actually emerge. For example, a common feeling in this regard is the routine monitoring and evaluation of such programs, which is often inappropriate, and thus its value in assessing the actual impact of such interventions upon those at whom it is targeted remains unclear. On balance, though, there are various reasons to be hopeful. First, the systematic and coherent use of sports has been shown to make an important, if measured, contribution to universal education, gender equality, poverty reduction, and the prevention of HIV AIDS. Second, sport embraces a wide variety of activities that can be tailored to the interests and abilities of people of all ages and that can take place locally and at a relatively low cost. Thirdly, is the growing body of evidence that sport is good for people who experience societal isolation and may in some cases be prone to mental health issues. An example of this initiative designed to address this very question was the finding by the Time to Change organisation via Comic Relief and DCMS of a programme in England developed in partnership with 16 professional football clubs that offered semi-structured football sessions as a means of developing conversations about life, related anxieties and concerns with young men. Critically, however, such sporting activities have to be constructed as a means to an end, not simply an end in themselves. As such, it is the nature, quality, and salience of the sporting experience, 
or as Fred Coulter describes it, the developmental experience within the sporting experience that creates the conditions for social change. For all of the underlying scepticism and caution, however, in the main there appears to be an emerging credible body of literature reporting an association between organised youth sport and positive health related educational and social outcomes. And this is particularly the case in relation to youth with lower capabilities for participation due to economic, cultural or social features. A sport as view, a sport are seen rather as an opportunity to engage such vulnerable young people in a leisure context, not only in terms of participation in sport, but also across a range of related activities. For example, in a recent British cohort study, Feinstead et al. found that for vulnerable groups, sport club attendance at the age of 16 years reduced the chances of social exclusion outcomes by the time those young people reach the age of 30. Thus, it's argued that wider benefits accruing from organised sports participation are stronger for disadvantaged youth with social and academic de deficits and families residing in high-risk neighbourhoods. Ultimately, therefore, it might be timely to consider if socially vulnerable or disadvantaged youth somehow become less vulnerable or disadvantaged by partaking in certain sporting initiatives. In this regard, Bailey suggests it is reasonable to assume that certain principles and conditions need to be fulfilled for sports to generate any such desired social <coughs> outcomes. Coulter argues that outcomes will equally be determined by the frequency and intensity of participation and the degree of participants' adherence over a prolonged period of time. Practitioners who work with socially vulnerable youth in a sport context may not, however, possess concrete principles that they can systematically integrate into their activities and program designs. On, it is, on this very theme, it is clear that if sports-based practices are to contribute to broader social outcomes for socially vulnerable groups, then there is a clear need for education and training of those who design and deliver such interventions. When all of this is considered and aggregated, Coulter and Taylor conclude that sport programmes which adopt a street-based or youth worker approach that are more person-centred than sports-centred and more youth work orientated than sports coach driven are potentially more effective when moving towards broader social outcomes, such as addressing isolation and educational underachievement. According to the authors, such programmes allow people, uh, allow more in-depth, intensive and extensive social relationships to form in seeking to bridge the dual role of the sports coach youth worker, it has even been suggested that it would be easier and more effective for youth workers to learn sports skills than it would for sports coaches to learn the skills of a youth worker. On this theme, when examining a range of UK and US-based sport inclusion programmes for youth, Ken Green from the University of Chester arrived at the conclusion that the most effective programmes are in fact those that are markedly different from traditional sports interventions, for example, alternative or lifestyle sports and pursuits. In relation to young people in vulnerable situations, it is suggested that certain adolescents reject organized, competitive, mainstream sports because these environments contain components similar to those that they have already failed to adequately negotiate. For example, adherence to formal rules, achievement of externally defined goals, and testing situations. As an illustration of some of these principles at work closer to home, a focus on the Sport Changes Life Foundation, which works closely with the University of Ulster, is useful. This organization works with young people experiencing high levels of deprivation, educational achievement, uh, educational underachievement, and youth disorder. The foundation uses sport as a catalyst for inspiration and change. Its flagship program, eHoops, is, is an intervention for young people not in or struggling with education, employment, or training. eHoops provides a six-month program of sport and education at the Jordanstown campus, plus ongoing one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentoring. This program exists in partnership with the PSNI, University of Ulster and community workers. 
Sport Team Does Life has received generous funding from the Department of Justice, Dell, and other agencies for its work and has a base in Newton Abbey, Mersey Street, and Andersonstown. Similarly, the University Sports Outreach Unit works with Sport Teams as Life on the Youth Engagement Through Sport, or YES, program. This program aims to introduce young people of school going age, young males from disadvantaged or underrepresented communities, to the concept of higher education. This is particularly important, of course, in light of the findings of a report published in 2011 entitled Educational Disadvantage in Working Class Protestant Communities that indicated, and some of you might be aware, that only one in ten young Protestants aspire to go to universities uh, here in Northern Ireland compared to one in five of Catholics of school leaving age. But as I say, the particular focus of the presentation today is around sports role in addressing mental health or at least prioritise these uh, what appear to be growing concerns around mental health and well-being of young people. And this is work that uh, Dr Lynette Hughes from Neve has been involved in, spoken quite widely on, and uh, on that note I'll hand over to Lynette to say more about that, that work now. Thank you. Um, so currently there are three um, approaches to sport and mental health. The first is the sport is good for all. Sport and physical activity has reported benefits for everyone who is involved in it. Secondly, then, sport and physical activity is a viable intervention for those who are already experiencing mental illness as an adjunct to their treatment. And then the third approach, sport is an ideal setting really for the promotion of public health messages as an active, engaging audience that are there who you can really um, pass those messages of well-being on to. So we'll take them singly. In terms of sport and physical activity for all, this has been widely communicated as um, the norm now that we see sport as just being the positive side of sport. Um, and this is in light of the research evidence of both the physical and mental health benefits that have been associated with that. Um, there's a large overlap if you look at the, the symptoms of mental health experience and also the benefits associated with being engaged in physical activity, such as reduced anxiety, um, tension, depression. Um, so there's a lot of overlap. So it's understandable why, in terms of policy, we can overemphasise the positives and forget that there is that darker side of sport that exists. Um, this is the other evidence base that is out there that physical activity in the elite um, competitive world can actually compromise um, health and well-being. In terms of overexposure, those who are training to a high intensity can uh, be vulnerable to the likes of overtraining. And uh, this has been linked to injury, infection, immunology um, suppression, diabetes and eating disorders. <coughs> so there's a whole host of mix that goes on within the sports setting and particularly the competitive sports setting that can actually lead competitive athletes or elite athletes vulnerable to mental health issues. Overtraining and burnout in particular have very strong correlates with affective disorders such as your major depressive disorder. There are other experiences as an athlete or a sports person that also leave you susceptible to the likes of depression such as injury, retirement, um, failure in your comp competition. So all of these functions can lead that competitive world uh, very vulnerable to mental health issues, which definitely does contrast the sport for all as, as good message. So in terms of bringing a more balanced approach to policy and making decisions, there's a need for different messaging really for those who are not participating at all in sport and physical activity, who need to try and get the associated benefits, both mental and physical but also then for those who are engaged at high intensity, that really there is an education strategy there that they will learn of the vulnerabilities of that whole sports setting that they're in. In terms of the monitoring and evaluating of what works well, we have no evidence that is Northern Ireland specific. Um, so we are overly reliant on studies from America, Australia, on college level athletes who are elite or um, competitive. We need an evidence base as well in terms of the prevalence of mental illness within our sporting world. So we, it's very hard if a young athlete is struggling maybe with depression um, or anxiety and they're in a competitive world and all of the messaging around them is telling them that, oh, you play sport, therefore you're protected, you should be feeling tip top, you should be feeling on top of the world, you should have no problems with mental illness. It leaves it actually a very stigmatising environment for that individual to then open up about having the experience of mental illness. In terms of then sport and physical activity as a viable intervention for those who already have experience of mental illness, 
um, research would show that in both clinical and non-clinical populations that both um, receive a benefit from physical activity, either as a preventative strategy or for the therapeutic benefits that are an add-on to the treatment of, of a mental illness. In terms of those who experience a mental illness, um, Sport, and uh, when used in randomised control trials, has been shown to be as effective as pharmacology and as the psychotherapy. So uh, on a par with the talking therapies and also the medication that is used in terms of its ability to upregulate our serotonin, our adrenaline and our feel-good hormones. There is still a continuing debate in terms of the amount, the type, the fre frequency, the intensity of physical activity that different populations need to get the required health benefits. So we have one end of the extreme where people are training to excess and the other where we have the general population at large struggling to meet the 30 minutes. How or how much we need to get the, those optimum benefits we still don't know in terms of our population across different age categories, across different people with different conditions. Um, interventions report a similar um, Outcome in terms of mental health and well-being for both clinical and non-clinical populations. So people who have experienced mental illness and people who don't still see the reported benefits in terms of reducing anxiety, depression, building self-esteem and confidence, all of the good stuff that we want to really see as a benefit of, of taking part in, in physical activity. Um, both bodies, in terms of the research from a clinical and non-clinical perspective, would be very cautious to highlight that Sport and physical activity in itself is not a magic one pill that fits all ills. That as an adjunct to treatment or as a preventative strategy, yes, it certainly helps. But there are other societal vulnerabilities that are at play that sport can certainly help in terms of building resilience and building self-esteem and confidence, but it's not going to fix all or mend all ailments that are there in society. In terms of the Northern Ireland context, again, we fall short in, in evidence of what types of interventions work well for our population. So we have high incidence of mental illness. Um, if you think of post-traumatic stress disorder, we don't know in terms of physical interventions within a Northern Ireland context what works, what doesn't. Um, so that is still the evidence base that we really need. The recent report by Bates in 2012, the NISRA report, had a recommendation that there would be an audit of all current interventions that were actually being rolled out across. And this is a real priority, that when we have invested the public money, we do need to find out, is it working, is it not? And there is as much merit in learning what doesn't work as there is in what does. So it's about hearing the good stories and the not so good stories. In terms of then applying interventions, um, the recommendations in terms of best practice would be to design those along with the academics in terms of making sure our target audience is there, the aims and objectives are clearly lined out, how we measure them and what we're trying to measure and how then we can show changes in well-being in terms of mental health. All of this in terms of building the evidence takes time, but it will then lead to a future where we will be able to be more informed about the policy, what we invest in, what works well to make sure that we're getting the best return for our investment. And then finally, um, the sports setting in terms of being ideal for the promotion of mental health messaging. Um, this is something that's really taken off over the last few years, where we see a, a greater link between the public health agency and reaching out to especially the bigger organisations, the sporting organisations, in terms of pushing the mental health message and putting it really on the agenda in an area that it generally doesn't be talked about. So when you're in the sports setting, it's very much to do with being in the psychological zone as opposed to anything of a mental health issue. Um, due to the high numbers that are involved in sport in Northern Ireland, across a range of different sports, it really is an ideal avenue and a, a route in, in terms of getting a, an active, engaging audience. But again, it's trying to get that right forum for passing that information on. The report, again, by Bates and Fernisra, again highlighted the potential role for sport and leisure sector to act as a vehicle for promoting messaging. But again, we need to be careful about the types of messaging. So if we're going into amateur elite or elite sports settings, the message is going to have to be around alerting people, yes, to general knowledge and insight about mental health and wellbeing, but also educating in terms of the vulnerabilities that they may be predisposed to because of that sports setting that they're in. 
One such um, example of a program at the minute that's running is the Mental Health and Wellbeing and Sport Pilot Program, which is engaging with 25 different clubs, five of each of the big three, the rugby, the soccer and the Gaelic, as well as boxing and, gloves, or boxing and um, golf. And really what they're doing is they're using this forum to get the message out, to get um, advertising out, to use the key sports personnel to address the mental health issue, to reduce the stigma in it, and with the view to gauge in the impact of it. Um, a similar, in a similar way, we need to be able to evaluate, has this had an impact? Has it reduced the stigma for people who are in sport? Has it reduced the stigma or understanding in terms of mental health journey for people in the general population? Has it made people who are engaged in sport more aware of how it does impact their mental health? Or equally, how the world leaves them vulnerable? So we do need to gauge in this. Um, so as we talk about a realist synthesis, we need to know what works best in what scenarios. So in the competitive world, the different message, message that will be promoted to those who aren't participating at all to try and get the bums off the seats. Um, feedback and, and evaluation is essential. And again, the best practice, the collaboration approach across organisations such as the Public Health Agency, Sport NA, um, the policies and procedures, and also then educating and training those who are on the ground facilitating this, and also educating in terms of being able to routinely collect the information and evaluate the services to make sure that what we're doing has a positive impact on mental health and wellbeing for all, irrespective of what level of engagement of sport that they're involved in. Thank you.